Hello, welcome to the Data and Measurement Validity module. I'm Wendy Chan, and I'll be the instructor for this module that covers different aspects of validity. Um, so this week we're going to be starting with construct validity, which is focusing on specific types of uh, ways of measuring um, uh, either a certain item or a certain attribute. And we're going to be tying the examples um, specifically to predictive modeling. So to start, what is construct validity? Construct validity refers to the degree to which a test, a tool, or a model actually measures what is intended to measure, uh, which is typically referred to as the underlying construct. And so for example, consider a general knowledge test about fractions, which you can think of as um, being administered to primary school students um, in a typical class setting. And the idea of this test is that um, it because the focus is on a specific topic, namely fractions, if the test is designed to assess knowledge of facts concerning performing arithmetic operations with fractions, such as adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing, the test questions should be designed to measure these specific skills. And if they do, then this um, is an example in which the feature of the test um, is known for its construct validity. However, if the test questions are long and complex reading passages, or they consist of uh, questions that have nothing to do with the topic at hand, namely fractions, then the test may not be fully measuring the factual knowledge about the topic at hand, which is um, about the operations that we can do with fractions. And as a result, um, in this example in which you are presented a test with, let's say, complex reading passages, this would constitute a threat to the construct validity of the exam. Now, an important question is, what is needed to establish construct validity? In practice, construct validity requires multiple sources of evidence. And these sources of evidence can be categorized into two main buckets. So to demonstrate construct validity, we need evidence that the test, the tool, or the model measures what is, what it is um, intended to measure, and evidence that the test, the tool, or the model does not measure irrelevant attributes, such as the complex reading passages that I re referred to in my previous example. Um, and importantly, both sources of evidence are required. So it's not sufficient to, and to just um, establish that the test measures what it is supposed to measure. We also have to illustrate that it is uh, omitting questions or other features that are deemed irrelevant to the topic at hand. So let's start with the first um, set of um, features, which is referred to as convergent validity. So this type of validity um, refers to evidence that the test um, or the model measures uh, what is intended to measure. Um, and in order to show convergent validity, two tests that are believed to measure closely related skills or types of knowledge should have a strong correlation with each other. As a result, the two tests um, should rank two students or multiple students who are uh, responding to a particular set of questions in the same way, they should be ranked in a similar way. And if we can establish this, then this um, helps us to support one important attribute of convergent validity. The other type of validity that is needed to um, examine whether we have construct validity um, supported is known as discriminant validity. And this um, type of validity is referring to whether the test or the tool um, is not measuring irrelevant attributes. So to show discriminant validity, we have to provide evidence that the two tests do not measure closely related skills or types of knowledge that are not strongly correlated with each other. Thus, a test that, um, going back to my previous example, a test about fractions should primarily try to measure constructs related to the arithmetic operations of fractions and not on reading or literacy constructs. In order to determine the construct validity of a particular fractions-based test, a researcher would need to demonstrate that the correlations of scores on that test with scores on other fractions-based tests are higher compared to scores on reading and literacy um, exams. Um, these, this type of exercise um, is important in order to really um, focus on developing questions that try to get at um, the types of information that researchers need in order to determine whether a certain type of tool or uh, model is actually capturing the, uh, the information that is related to the research questions at hand. Um, so to wrap up this um, 
this part of um, the module, I want to provide an example in digital learning. Um, and this particular example um, focuses on uh, a goal of researchers, um, which is to try to measure um, affective states. In this case, I'm trying to measure um, features related to boredom. So here, um, one of the focus um, in educational and digital learning research is trying to develop models to measure whether a student is entering a, a boredom state. And the evidence has suggested that boredom is associated with negative learning outcomes, more so than affective states such as frustration and confusion. In addition, boredom can be detected by physical sensors or through interactions between students and educational software. But an important question is, how can we develop a model to accurately predict the affective state of boredom, since it is um, so important in understanding the association with negative learning outcomes? And as a result, um, in the future, it might be helpful to develop interventions um, or to think of ways to minimize the chances that students enter this affective state um, in the hopes of improving their learning outcomes. So in many areas of research on learning systems, it is common to employ machine learning algorithms to extract features that are assumed to be strongly correlated with an outcome and to build analytic models that yield accurate predictions. And just to give a brief background about machine learning, machine learning is a class of methods um, that were developed to uh, try to process large amounts of data. Um, an important feature of machine learning methods is that some of them are algorithm-based um, in the sense that um, a certain um, function is applied over a large amount of data, um, and the goal of the function is the same regardless of whether the data come from one source or another. And the advantage of machine learning methods is that because it can handle large amounts of data, whenever uh, we are trying to um, extract features or get information um, from lots of different data sources, machine learning methods provide a way to kind of streamline that process. And in this case, um, to identify which of those features uh, would help us in understanding um, the associations with a certain type of outcome, such as boredom. So to build these um, types of models or detectors of affective states, researchers can collect human assessments of disengagement and boredom and use machine learning approaches to develop models that can replicate the human judgments. In order to build these models, the machine learning approach requires that the data be split into a training and a validation data set. So a training data set is um, usually like half or a proportion of the data in which the models are fit um, to assess the strength of the relationship between certain types of features that are extracted in relation to the outcome. And then once these relationships are um, assessed and determined to um, be fitting to the problem at hand, those models are then fit on the validation data set, which can be the other half of the data or, or the remaining part of the data that is left over, in order to assess the accuracy of the, um, the predictions from, from those machine learning models. Um, and in this example, in order to detect boredom, the machine learning algorithm will assess the correlation between various features, such as maybe um, the time it takes that, uh, the student to complete a certain problem, or the amount of time that a student has been hovering over a problem um, in, and in relation to the boredom outcome. And once it determines whether um, some of these features are either related to the system or to the program itself are the ones that are strongly correlated with um, the boredom outcome, it can then um, build a predictive model and test it out on the validation data set. So once all features are selected, the model is then fit on the validation data set. And if it um, shows to have high predictive accuracy, then it can be potentially generalizable to other similar types of data sources, whether they come from the same program, from the same student population, uh, or more importantly, to measure the same outcome, which in this case is boredom. Now, one way to strengthen the constructability of these models or detectors is to filter out features that are deemed irrelevant or weakly correlated with the outcome. So this is going back to the idea of trying to strengthen the discriminant validity of the model by preemptively removing irrelevant features. And so really having the algorithm and the model itself be trained on the features that have already been filtered out and that have already been assumed um, to not be related to the direct um, outcome of interest. 
And prior work has shown that removing these irrelevant features does yield models with better overall predictive performance, um, even with the data reduction, since removing features um, necessarily requires a reduction in sample size. And the process of selecting features that were less correlated with the constructs contributed the most um, to the predictive accuracy. So as another analogy, once um, we remove these irrelevant features, we are essentially minimizing the amount of noise um, in the data in order to really hone in on the signal, which is the, in this case, the relationship between um, these different features of a system with trying to predict um, when a student has entered a, a boredom effective state. So to wrap up with some concluding remarks, um, one is that constructability plays an important role in both testing and model prediction um, because the goal ultimately is to make sure that the tools, whether they are instruments, um, whether they are models, or whether they are exams, is actually providing information about the idea or the topic that we're interested in. And determining the strength of the construct validity of a model requires an assessment of the convergent and discriminant validity of the tool. And again, remember that both of these types of validity are necessary to establish whether there is a strong construct validity of a model. And moreover, prior research suggests that centering models on strengthening construct validity leads to improvements in predictive accuracy, particularly when it is done in combination with automated and manual feature selection.